All right, guys, we are back. Special thanks to Bleacher Report for having me. I am Jake Ellen Bogan. You can find me on Twitter at JK Bogan. I am on the Believe in Rams podcast hosted by myself and former Ram Cameron Lynch, as well as Off the Edge, uh, in which we cover the NFL and Downtown Rams with my co-host Alexis Kraft. And today we are going to be talking about the Rams and five bold predictions I have. And as you can see right off the rip, we're talking 2-2 Atwell, the Rams' former second-round pick in 2021. And this is somebody that's been labeled a bust by many. However, I think this is the big breakout season for 2-2 Atwell from Louisville. And the reason being is he was arguably, you know, he has arguably the second-best production coming into this game this weekend uh, against this type of team. Uh, against Seattle, he has nine touches for over 109 total yards and a touchdown. Um, the only production who has, you know, the only one who has more production on the Rams that can currently play is Tyler Higby. Um, but last year in week 18, he had his way against the Seahawks defense. And the only issue really that held him back was Baker Mayfield's limitations. Um, in my opinion, there were three touchdowns that were on the left on the field when it came to Atwell. And I think when you look at Atwell and Stafford, um, the last time they shared the field together, you saw electricity, you saw fireworks, that big touchdown against the Saints. Stafford was out for the year. You didn't see it happen again. So now the next time Stafford's out there, Atwell is the number two receiver. And so I think with Cooper Cup, you look at him being out those first four games, potentially even more uh, in all likelihood, I think Atwell is in a very good spot, was already going to be the starting wide receiver three uh, in this offense. But, you know, now he gets bumped up to the wide receiver two spot. And I think, you know, not just factoring in the cup injury, but just the fact that Atwell's versatility is going to allow him to be used all over the offense, seemingly. Um, you know, obviously he has the deep ball ability. He has the route running ability. He plays bigger than he is going up and high pointing the football at that crazy 5'9 frame. And what I mean by crazy is it's not crazy at all. He's only 5'9" but he's going to play. He's going to try and moss uh, a defensive back. If he has to do that, um, we've seen him used, you know, as a runner as well with the ball in his hand. But I think when you look at it, this is a thousand yard receiver upcoming. This is my big uh, start to the bold prediction section here. I think when you look at the fact that he is considered that one trick pony by people, um, I would disagree but a guy, in order to get to a thousand yards, you're either going to need to haul in a, a ton of passes, or you're going to be able to, you know, get a ton of yards off those passes. And so when I look at him, he's somebody that he can haul in a bunch of passes this year, and he could have a bunch of receptions. But the key with him is going to be yards per reception, which will get him over a thousand. And keep this in mind: a thousand, you know, and this sounds bold, right? But a thousand in the seventeen game era of the NFL season isn't as hard to come by as it used to be. Um, so I think it's time for audiences to stop looking at Tutu Atwell as if he's Tavon Austin and start looking at him as if he is Marquise Brown. So Tutu Atwell, we started off is the first bold prediction here going over a thousand. And I feel very good about that. Moving on the next bold prediction here. I have the Rams acquiring an edge defender at the deadline. And I understand that is very bold, right? To predict a trade, to, to come out and say there's going to be a trade that happens. But I think when you look at this edge room, you see guys like Byron Young that give you some sort of uh, feel there. Obviously, Byron Young, third round pick, very high on him coming out of Tennessee but we don't know exactly what he's going to be. He is a rookie. You look at Michael Hoyt last year, uh, better than we expected, but you're not feeling great about Hoyt coming off that, you know, the preseason in which he seemed a little lackluster. Then you got Nick Hampton, who when they drafted him out of App State, the guy is raw, okay? They knew that, so they kept him on the roster. He's a high draft pick, but I don't know how much of an impact he's going to make this year. And then you look at Zach Van Valkenburg, who made it, and he was playing deep into the last preseason game. And while I like him, I like how hard nosed he is. I like that, you know, this guy just has a, a serious knack for finding the football. But at the end of the day, this is not a good edge room at all. 
Uh, this is one of the weakest, I would say weakest positional rooms in the entire league and one of the least experienced. I mean, we're talking about the only guy in that edge room that has any sort of starting experience or just in-game NFL experience being Michael Hoyt. So here's the thing. This brings me back to 2018 when the Rams went to the Super Bowl that year. They started that season with Trayvon Young. They started that season with Justin Lawler, with Matt Longacre, and Samson Ibukam. So Samson Ibukam and Matt Longacre were your starters. Okay? And mid-season, they went out and they traded for Dante Fowler Jr., who was originally a third overall pick. He suffered a season-ending injury, and then eventually he couldn't really catch back up with the, the defense. He needed a change of scenery, and eventually the Jaguars shipped him off to the LA Rams. And he's a big reason why they ended up going to the Super Bowl. His juice off the edge allowed them to get to that point. He made a crucial play in that NFC title game in overtime to basically force Drew Brees into throwing interception that lost them the game. So when I look at this, I think you see that big guy right there on the screen. You see him. Obviously, you know who that is. That's Chase Young. If you've been following me, you know I've been talking about him for a while. And there's a reason for that. Okay. Chase Young, second overall pick, a guy that has had a hard time staying healthy. Stop me if I sound like we're talking about Dante Fowler Jr. And now here he is, his fifth year option, just like Dante Fowler Jr. was not picked up. And so I think that there is a serious chance of trading for Chase Young. And I think they're going to make a trade. I'm not saying Chase Young will be that trade. I'm saying for an edge defender, for a pass rusher at the deadline. So of all those options that we talk about, you have this edge room being as weak as it is. You do feel good about Byron Young at the very least because he barely played in preseason for a reason. Michael Hoyt, I'm not feeling great about as a starter. But why would the Rams do this? Because a lot of people are under the impression that the Rams aren't going to be very good. So this is why they would do something like this. Because they're not going to go out and find somebody like Chandler Jones. They're not going to go out and trade for somebody like, you know, sign a Justin Houston or trade for somebody like Jadavian Clowney. They're going to go out and trade for somebody who they could bring back next year as part of their next era of Rams football. And that's why Chase Young, to me, makes a lot of sense. Because you bring in Chase Young, you have plenty of cap next year, around $60 million and then some. And you bring in Chase Young, no fifth-year option, so he is a free agent. You trade for him, you go out, you sign him, there you go. Now you have Chase Young to build around after Aaron Donald. But it's not just Chase Young here. There's another one that's interesting. There's another three, actually. One comes from Jacksonville. Caleb on chase on who funny enough was drafted by the Jaguars with the pick, the very pick, the first pick the Rams traded away in that Jalen Ramsey deal. So Caleb on chase on has been buried on the depth chart. He's behind the likes of Trayvon Walker and Josh Allen. And if the Jaguars were going to trade anybody at the deadline, while Josh Allen might be a free agent after the season, Josh Allen is not somebody they're training away. He's starting. Caleb on chase on the other hand, hasn't really done anything in his career. He's one of those guys. Maybe you take a, a gander at, you take a look at, you see what you have, and maybe you put him in an, a role where he can succeed. That's an option there. Obviously a lot less, a lot less than chase young, but could be an interesting option. Another one is Josh Uche from the new England Patriots. I personally don't think the Patriots are going to be that great this year. I have them winning five games. Josh Uche is going to be a free agent. Patriots don't pay their free agents. They normally let everyone walk in the off season. Would you want to get, you know, a decent draft pick for a Josh Uche? Maybe the Rams give up a second rounder for a guy that can set the edge. Well, defend the run, but he's also really turned himself into a stud pass rusher. So you get that second rounder that you essentially spent on him in that draft out of Michigan back. You, you, you give that away. You go out and you get Josh Uche if you're the Rams. And that's a pretty darn good starter right there. And then the last option here is Rayshon Gary of the Green Bay Packers. 
Now, Ray Sean Gary is playing in a Green Bay Packers organization right now that just watched Aaron Rodgers go. They sent, they essentially trade him away. And yes, they got some stuff in return. But at the end of the day, this is not a team I expect to be in the playoffs. So maybe at the deadline, they decide, oh, well, we're not going to sign Ray Sean Gary and you trade him over to the Rams. And now the Rams, they don't necessarily have to be like when they had Dante Fowler, they, they made that trade. They were undefeated or they had lost one game at that point. The Rams don't have to be undefeated to make this trade because they can think more long-term. This is not just a win now trade. This is a trade that would get you better at the time, but then also down the road, you know, you can sign these guys long-term and you have that going for you. So that's how I feel. I do think they're going to make a trade for a pass rusher. I think that's always been the plan. And they've kind of teased that because there have been some guys that they could have signed that they chose not to. Makes me think that they're waiting on a, a big name pass rusher there. Um, but a young one, keyword young, because moving forward, they want a guy that can be a part of their uh, their next era of Rams football. So we move on to the third bold prediction here that I have. And I have the Rams finishing top five offensively. And now this sounds crazy because obviously with everything going on with Cooper Cup, how does this happen? Well, I'll tell you right now, okay? They had a bad offensive line last year, a lot of injuries. Um, ultimately, they had like 16, 17 different offensive line combinations. They were banged up pretty much the entire season. I trust the deepest tight end room they've had in quite some time. I trust the wide receiver room, even without Cup, because I think... Van Jefferson in a contract year. He's hungry. We talked about Tutu Atwell. Puka Nakua is getting all sorts of good vibes coming out of camp. And, you know, they're talking about him being the wide receiver three this weekend. You got Demarcus Robinson, who's a seasoned veteran, hasn't missed any playing time in the NFL, who, you know, can help you kind of all over the field. You also have Ben Skoranek, who I think is a little underrated. And you have Tyler Johnson on your practice squad. So I like the receiver room. The running back room is as deep as ever. Uh, you talk about Kyron Williams getting first team reps, Cam Akers, who I think is going to have a really good season. Then Ronnie Rivers and what he did in preseason. You got Zach Evans, the rookie, as well as Royce Freeman on the practice squad, a veteran that can come in, can help in pass pro and can help in the short and intermediate game. And so I look at all of that. And then I look at the fact that they bring in Mike LaFleur uh, to come out with more of a balanced approach, running the football, uh, prioritizing the running backs and trying to keep the pressure off of Stafford. Cause a big reason why the pressure was so bad. Yes. You can say it was, it was devoid of talent on the offensive line, but the bigger reason is because the Rams simply put, didn't do a good enough job of mixing up the playbook. They didn't do a good enough job of balancing their offense. They were a very pass heavy offense. When Stafford was in there, there was no sort of run game to speak of. And it made things really hard on just everybody. So now you run the ball a little bit better. You know, I think that's why they brought in LaFleur. You see what he did last year before Brees Hall tore his ACL after he tore his ACL, having to get, uh, you know, creative with Bam Knight, who was a UDFA who they really liked. Uh, you know, then you have Ty Johnson and you have Michael Carter, uh, the second, and you have to start mixing things up. And that's, I think what Mike LaFleur brings to the table. So with that said, you talk about all that. You talk about the potential two, two at well breakout season. Like I talked about Cooper cup is going to be back at some point. You have Van Jefferson in a contract here. Matthew Stafford is feeling as good as he's ever felt. And you talk about him. Now he lost some weight. He's, he's lighter on his feet. He can move around better, so better uh, mobility. And then again, he improved offensive line, going out, drafting Steve Avila, trading for Kevin Dotson to shore up that depth. This is one of the better offensive lines, aside from not having Whitworth. It's one of the better offensive lines after that, uh, you know, depth-wise that they've had since McVay took over as Rams head coach. Um, so I look at this offense. I think they're ready. Uh, Matthew Stafford had plenty of time to kind of just sit there, not get hit last year. That's a lot of time off. I think he's going to be chomping at the bit. I think Sean McVay, what we're going to find out is rebuilt this offense. I won't say from the ground up, but he's rebuilt it enough where he's going to keep teams guessing. They finished top five uh, in this third bold prediction here on the offensive side of the ball. The next bold prediction, the second to last one here, 
We have the Rams finishing 10 and seven. So they win 10 games Uh, to add on to the Rams. I believe with the explosive balanced offense, the defense is going to be dealing with growing pains. No doubt about it. Um, I expect Seattle, you know, um, you know, starting off like right off the rip. I think week one against Seattle, I think they're going to have their way against this defense. I think it's going to be a shootout. I think it's going to be a barometer of where you are early on in the season. We saw all those things, you know, coming out of camp, those joint practices against the Raiders and the Broncos that the Rams defense actually looked pretty good. But at the end of the day, I think when you look at this defense with Raheem Morris and what he's done, they were in every single game last year going into the fourth quarter because the defense came through. You can say that was with Jalen Ramsey. You could say that was with Bobby Wagner. You could say that was with Leonard Floyd, but it didn't matter because they were always dealing with injuries. And we only talk about on the offensive side of the ball, but at the beginning of the year, three out of the four top corners were injured to start the season. So you talk about that. Aaron Donald only played half the season. So now you have Aaron Donald healthy, I think this defense is going to be decent and I think they could be in the top 15 when it's all said and done. However, it's going to take time. They are going to go through those growing pains. And I think the big thing here that you look at is this offense being able to win in those shootouts, this offense being able to win when it matters the most, you have one of the most clutch quarterbacks in the NFL. So obviously when you look at the NFL wins and losses are decide between two to four plays. And when I have a Matthew Stafford on my roster and I have Sean McVay guys that have gotten it done at the highest level, I believe that you're in pretty good shape there. You got cam Akers, who I think can run out the clock in those situations. I think they're going to have more opportunities to be in these games late in games that I think they're going to steal some games that people do not have on their radar right now. Even still, I don't think they have to steal that many to win 10 games. I think they're going to be better than people see. They rebuilt the offensive scheme. I think they're going to be aggressive on the defensive side. They're going to be blitzing. They're going to have somebody in, you know, Jacoby Durant who showed you what he can do as far as a guy that can break the game open. He had a nose for the football last year, led the league in interception return yardage. So I'm feeling pretty good altogether about this bold prediction of them getting 10 wins. I think a lot of people have them winning four or five games. We have to look at it. Are they really going to do that again? I trust Sean McVay in week one and beyond. And one thing I'll say is what I've been hearing is that around the league, executives around the league actually really respect the Rams a lot more than the audience, the fans and the media consensus would have you believe. So if the Rams are better than advertised, do not be surprised. I've been singing my praises about the 10 and seven record, and I'm going to stick by it. The Rams go 10 and seven. The last bold prediction here for you guys is a big one at 10 and seven. What happens? What do we make of it? I say playoffs. And I think they're getting to the divisional round of the NFC playoffs, because when you look at it, I don't think 10 and seven wins you the NFC West. I do not see that. I don't think 10 and seven wins you the NFC West. I don't see that, but I do think it gets you the fifth seed. Okay. This is the important thing here because if it gets you the fifth seed, you have to imagine that in the NFC South, you can say what you will. I feel, you know, pretty good about the Panthers, the Falcons, the saints, the bucks. That's going to be a dog fight in the NFC South, but those aren't great teams. Okay, those aren't a team. That's not like playing, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles winning their division or the 49ers. So with that said, the Rams would be looking sure at a road game in the playoffs, but they'd be looking at the fifth seed going against the fourth seed, which would likely be the South team. And I have that South team being the Carolina Panthers by a game. I have the Falcons making the playoffs as well as the seventh seed, but they would play the two seed. So because of that, I have the Rams playing the Carolina Panthers with a rookie quarterback in Bryce Young. I believe that is an advantage there. It's an advantage when you look at Sean McVay and what he's done in the playoffs. You look at Matthew Stafford, Aaron Donald. I think the Rams would win that game in the wild card 
move on to the divisional round, and they would lose to the Detroit Lions. I believe that at the end of the day, that is a big time win of a season. They are in a rebuild, guys. They can call it a remodel all they want. They can rename it whatever they want. But at the end of the day, they are on a rebuild. The difference is they're trying to win. They're not tanking. They're trying to get the most out of it. It's why they showed urgency with Cooper Cup. A team that was tanking would not care about Cooper Cup. They would just say, yeah, he's out for the season. Or they would just not really have an answer. They put him on IR and just figure it out later. But this team clearly cares about winning. And they have guys in this organization on the coaching staff that not only care about winning, but have already done it at the highest possible level winning the Super Bowl. That doesn't go away. And after last season, if you expect them to tank after going five and 12 and enduring all of those injuries and just the awful season they had, if you think Sean McVay decided not to retire or take a hiatus to come back just to tank, then I don't really know what to tell you. But I will tell you this. These five bold predictions, while bold, I think are somewhat realistic here. Because I think it's definitely fair to say that a team that had one of the highest scoring offenses and one of the most electric offenses in 2021 at the beginning of the season with Matthew Stafford, I think it's fair to say that with Sean McVay as the primary play caller, just like he was then, and obviously learning from last year, it's fair to say that if they stay healthy, they can be top five. I think it's fair to say a second round wide receiver finally getting his chance to start and showing you what he could do as far as just absolutely dissecting defenses, getting open and just now having Matthew Stafford throwing him the ball instead of Baker Mayfield. I think it's fair to say that he could go off this year. I think it's fair to say the Rams could win 10 games. Wasn't that long ago, 2017 McVay's first year in the league, mind you that this team was four and 12. McVay added a few players, obviously Robert Woods, a guy that some people thought was overpaid. Andrew Whitworth, who dealt with some injuries that thought maybe he was over the hill. And sure enough, a draft class that look, they got John Johnson. They got Cooper cup. These guys didn't run fast 40 times, right? They didn't have great combines, but they went out, they got these guys and they ended up going to the playoffs for the first time in over a decade. And so when you look at it, I trust the guy that did that. I trust Sean McVay and I'm not, I'm not out on him. And no matter what anyone says about this team, I don't think with his resume, you can doubt him. I don't believe that because before last season, guys, 2019 was brutal and they would have made it under the seven team format in the playoffs that we now have. That was the last year of the six team format. So they would have made the playoffs. They went nine and seven. It took a bevy of injuries. It took everything. You were starting your third string quarterback and you were picking up a quarterback off of waivers and starting him in the middle of a primetime game, like without any knowledge of the playbook. And you were winning a game with that guy. It took all of that for Sean McVay to have his first losing season. So I do believe at the end of the day, they are going to make the playoffs. I do believe at the end of the day, this offense is going to be good. And I do believe that the defense, albeit getting a lot of flack because they're a lot younger and they're unproven, is going to show some flashes. And what does this do? Well, if you remember in 2020, Jared Goff with the number one defense, that offense ran the ball well. They didn't throw the ball well. They still got to the divisional round. They had a valiant effort against a team that was just simply better in the Green Bay Packers. They went back to the drawing board. They ended up acquiring Matthew Stafford. And a few, you know, a few moves later, you're talking about them back in the, the Super Bowl and winning it. So is that to say that 2024, the Rams are back in the Super Bowl? Not necessarily. But I do think that this is a good bouncing, a good year to bounce up. This is a boost, okay? This is what happens when a team has good coaching. They put together decent talent in the middle of a rebuild and still go for it. It helps to try and win now instead of tanking. Build that momentum. Find out who you have in this wide receiver room. Find out who you have on the defense. Who is going to stick around? 
And then 2024 with extra cap space, you got, like I said, 60 million. You can figure things out. You can make different moves on the roster, guys that don't fit, guys that do fit. And then maybe by 2025, they're one of the best teams in football. Another thing I'll say before I head off, Matthew Stafford is 35. He doesn't need to retire today, tomorrow, down the road, maybe. But this guy is 35. And the way he's talked about is like he's 39, 40, and he's already contemplated retirement. Matthew Stafford has never wanted to retire. And the only thing I've heard come out of his mouth is that he wants to play until he's 40. We'll see what happens, but I'm not going against the Sean McVay coached football team. I don't buy into the narrative that they're tanking. I don't care if Caleb Williams is a possibility or not. They're not tanking. And I think at the end of the day, it will make them better because of that. And when you see the same teams picking at the top of the order in the draft, that's why. Because that is the mentality they have. And that's the difference between an organization that has been in two Super Bowls since hiring their coach, their rookie coach, seven years ago, and not seeing the playoffs, period. But I'm Jake Ellenbogen. This has been uh, my five bold predictions for the Rams 2023 season, courtesy of Bleacher Report. I thank you guys for tuning in, and I will see you guys soon. You guys take care.